Hello, I'm David Eicholtz with David Richard Gallery located in New York City. And um, standing here today with Heather Jones. And we are standing in front of her most newest material, literally very new, and um, in her first solo show with our gallery, <clears throat> but not your first show in New York. Is this, or? Well, it's my first solo show. First solo, yes. okay. Yeah. Yeah, and you have a studio here, but your actually do. main home is in Ohio, and yes. you, sh you share a studio with a couple of other artists here. So, right. and that's been really nice. In fact, that's uh, where we met. Right. And uh, but I've been following you a long time on Instagram and um, and other things because I've always liked textiles and things. So, um, so this is her first show with us. It also happens to coincide with another solo show that she has going on in Ohio, in Dayton, Ohio, and it's called Contemporary Dayton. Right. And um, what, why don't you give the little bit of backdrop about that? Because you've got like the f main stage, but there's three different solo shows. Right, yeah, there are three concurrent solo exhibitions. Um, I do have the largest space, but I am um, showing and paired with the work of Odili Don Odita, who creates beautiful geometric abstraction. Um, he, he and his team came in and did a site-specific mural for the gallery. Um, and then there is a video component, and the video is by Jeffrey Gibson. Um, and the video is called To Feel Myself Beloved on the Earth. So it's this really interesting, to me, this interesting dynamic of the work of the three of us. Um, you know, they're all geometric abstractions. They all, I think, deal with our sort of cultural identity and our history. So um, I think I'm, I'm really excited to be paired with these two artists who happen to be two of my favorites as well. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. You've known uh, Odili and, and not Gibson. personally, but yes, oh, uh, but knew of his work. Yeah. Yes, and gotcha. I did have the chance to meet him uh, last month. But oh, yeah. that's nice. Yeah, it was great. And so that kind of gets into something kind of important about your work is, uh, which is why I wanted you to tee that up. Um, you, you were born and raised in Cincinnati, yeah. right, in Ohio. I was born in Dayton, grew up in Cincinnati, but yes, okay. close enough. And. Um, but your family's from Kentucky originally, right? Just yeah, across a, the river. A large section of my family is from Eastern Kentucky, so about um, hour and a half or so south of Cincinnati. Okay. Yep. Okay. Because in your writing, you do mention um, that Appalachia is is a key a component of your work. It's right. an influence. Right. And uh, but what's also very interesting is um, the you. you your work, so that in case people just don't know about Heather, she only works with textiles. And these are paintings, and she considers them paintings. They are stretched on stretcher bars. But they were all made of cotton fabric that's already printed. You know, it's already been dyed or exactly. printed or whatever methodology it was made. And um, so it still has the sizing or whatever the process yeah. you know, materials are that they use. And so the sheens are as they are, mm -hmm. and they vary a little bit. They do, but yeah. most of yours are kind of matte to flat, but there yeah. are some that have a sheen. And so uh, what she does is essentially her paint becomes then these slices, wedges, triangles, squares, or whatever she decides to cut out, and, uh, and then and sewn together. So they read graphic and flat, yeah. and, um, but at the same time, because they're sewn and they're hand done, um, there, there are just some things where sometimes the, there may be, although this one has very little wavering of the lines, this is pretty, <laughs> pretty sharp, but um, there's a couple things going on in this one that I wanted to point out though. One is, so everything doesn't always perfectly line up, but yet you know the intention and you read it as hard edge and geometric and you read these as sort of uh, classical sort of optical art to some extent. Yeah. Um, but the thing that's operating interestingly here, and you pointed this out to me, I don't know, a year or two ago when we met in your mm -hmm, studio, because mm -hmm. you just started doing this. You used to fuss a lot about your, when you, when you would sew fabric together, for those of you who don't know, and I'm sure most of you do know, but you bring two pieces together, but you have to fold them down so that you can kind of sew and, and have uh, an, an edge. So you have to have something you're holding onto on the other side of the, the, the thread and the bobbin. And, um, and then you open it up and pull it straight. Well, you used to then, I guess, trim those down or get it so they weren't hiding, but this time now, you, you've, in, in a lot of these, you've, so, you've, you've pressed them, I guess, so that they yeah. stayed, so that you can see, the, if you will, 
it's not really a true selvage edge, but it sort of is like a selvage it's like edge. It's the seam allowance, but you know, it's yeah. where the seam that is constructed. Yeah, I mean, I... Um, but you can see it through. Exactly, and I do that on purpose because to me, those become elements of um, transparency, you know, of sort of linear qualities. I feel like some of the strings that you can sometimes see, they're almost like little drawings. So, you know, even though I'm not working with traditional painting materials such as, you know, oil paint or acrylic, I'm really thinking of this in a painterly fashion. And I do have experience painting with real paint. Um, I just choose not to these days, but Correct. I still like to think about those things as I'm working. So think about those, you know, elements that are so inherent to traditional art, I mean, traditional painting materials. Um, and I try to explore and push those in these works. And that's a good point. So yeah. she is trained <laughs> formally and, and well-educated in art and art history. And so, um, but as she said, because of her background and just interest, her interest in her work, which we're getting to, um, she just chose to use this as essentially an alternative painting material. Right. But what's interesting about it too is it, um, the reason why I was kind of showing these things is not always being perfectly right. squared up or having this, this sort of, would you call it this, uh, the allowance? Um, the seam allowance. Seam allowance. Yeah, yeah. Revealed. Essentially, right. you're letting the process be revealed. You're not exactly. trying to hide it. Exactly. And the other thing, too, is because of these sort of the fact that you're dealing with this, this fabric and it, it exists in a certain shape and dimension, and there's, it's not always perfect, you know, although you're very good at doing this, and you've been doing it long enough, but you're quite good at obviously at sewing to get this pretty darn close and many of right. them do touch in or perfect like right. you know, this and here are like you know perfect but what's interesting though is it, they become like process paintings right because some of it is a little out of control exactly. out of your control 100 percent right and so therefore there's always a little bit of a hmm you know <laughs> and sometimes it could be a, like a hmm or it's like hmm right no, <laughs> there, for right? sure right yeah because i never thought about that sorry until these have, i've been you know living with them now for a week looking right. at them right, on the right. wall yeah, I mean, that's a good point, too, because the, and I don't, I mean, you know, these are obviously influenced by quilt making, and we talked a little bit about that as well. Right. You know, both quilts that my family members made, but also, you know, quilts of G's Bend, um, a known artist, primarily American women who, you know, have been working for hundreds of years on similar work. And my favorite parts are those are always the imperfections where they're not yeah. quite right, where maybe she ran out of this fabric and she had to substitute whatever she had on hand. So I purposely don't measure precisely so that I don't have that. It's that it's not perfect. I'm really it's sort of like a brush and rug weaving. Where yeah, you exactly. Dye lot changes and, right. and you still got to keep making you just it blue. Keep making, right. <laughs> it's just a little different. Blue exactly. Now. <laughs> right. So I love those the collectors little bits. love that sort of stuff. Well, good. I mean, <laughs> to me, like those, um, you know, so you're right, I have an idea of what it's going to look like, but because of the nature of the way this fabric behaves, you know, it's mm -hmm. much thinner than a canvas. It's a, um, you know, it could be used for garments, it could be used for drapery, um, this fabric that I use. But because of its thinness, when the, the fabric is pulled taut over the yeah. wooden panel, things shift a little bit. Exactly. And that's what you were talking about. You know, I don't quite know exactly what's going to happen. There's a little bit of stretch if it's cut on the bias, which is exactly. like, you and know, against the get grain. Right, it gets Right, it gets a little cattywampus. And yeah. I love those bits because, again, it's just that, to me, if they were so strict and geometrically perfect and everything lined up, I don't think I personally would find them as Well, then there's no need to not avoid painting. You right. might as well just paint and exactly. use tape. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, so are those little elements of, you know, like where they don't quite line well, up. Well, because the yellow that you added, which, by the way, uh, yeah. when they were delivered. Yeah, yeah. I, it was a surprise I, I, I heard. I comment, I'm like, whoa, I love that. Yeah, you know, yeah. And I'm not sure he, if he thought at first I liked it or didn't like it, but I love it. First of all, I love that color. Yes. But good. to me, it was just like the, it just set it off. Yeah. Because you had shown me pictures before the right. green had been added. Exactly right. And I fell in love with it as soon as I saw oh, it. Oh, good. Yeah. But then when it arrived here, I was like, oh my God, that yeah. just like finished it, you know? But again, it's, it's, um, you know, it, it's not exactly the same all the way around because no, these no, are no. basically if so people are not if, so they're not confused. She did these as four separate panels, which yeah. thank you for doing that because it You're makes welcome. it easier to transit <laughs> for transport sure. it. Yeah. But it's four stretch panels that are then bolted together. Uh, when you're ready to hang it right and so that's why there's a little bit of uh, disruption here yeah 
But we're spending the time on this because I think it helps set the stage for people so that when we talk about the other things, yep. they're kind of like, ah, okay, now I understand the medium and I understand what this is all about. Right. And, but what's cool about it, and this is a good example because um, it's so striking. You, you get it, it's sort of this really strong geometric. And I still haven't really figured out the pattern on this one, I have to admit. Yeah. Um, but you have to really kind of get away from them and look at them. It's like, uh, you, people can't see them here, but those two uh, purple and black and lavender ones, all of a sudden, when they were up on the wall and I walked away, I realized, oh my God, they're two triangles. Right. But you don't see it at all when right. you look at it online. I don't pick right. that up. Yeah. And, uh, but what's nice about this is, I love your work because it reads so hard edge, geometric, and optical. Yeah. And, and I think part of it is, it's these, you know, the, the angles, it's these, these strong contrasts. Here we're looking at black and white. We're gonna look at other paintings where you do it with dichroic combinations, mm -hmm. where, which are much more vibratory. Yeah. But what it does is these just inherently, the color, makes it vibrational. The fact right. that things are at angles and on grids, yeah. and there's a little bit of disruption in that, it sort of activates the eye. And you do see them in a very different way, and it's a very powerful tool, and you deploy it a, a lot in your work. And so, um, but you know, the other thing too that I want people to realize is there is a very feminist angle to your work, and part of it is, um, you always sort of reference, and in fact, the title of the show, if you want to speak about the title of the show, yeah. uh, you always seem to reference and, and uh, gravitate towards very powerful women who uh, have a very strong social conscience and, and activists. Yeah. And so if, if you, this is titled after a poem by Bell Hook. Right. And so if you want to give the title and talk a little bit about that sure. and what your familiarity with her is. Yeah, um, so the title of the show is To Hold Tender This Land, and it's a line from her um, poem, The Appalachian Elegy. Mm -hmm. um, so Bell Hooks um, taught last at Berea College in eastern Kentucky, and that's right near where my family is from. They're from Kirby Knob, which is, a, you know, literally this little dot on the map that's like 20 minutes from there. So, so did you ever met her? No, I never met her, oh, okay. no. Um, but she was just a very local figure for you. Yeah, I Even mean, though she was a national figure. <laughs> right, and I think I connected with that sense um, of her writing in that poem particularly, just with the fact, I mean, you know, I, as you mentioned, I grew up in Cincinnati, so that's obviously not Eastern Kentucky. My family moved from Eastern Kentucky, as many people did in the, you know, 19-teens, 1920s, um, for jobs. They came north yeah. looking for jobs, that kind of great migration. And so... And Dayton is home of Frigidaire. <laughs> it, well, Frigidaire, uh, you know, there was uh, a big GM factory there. There was uh, the tire plants. Yeah. yeah, all the National Cash Register. So a lot of my family came up um, looking for jobs and sort of settled in communities outside of Dayton proper. Um, my parents left those small towns and went to the big city of Cincinnati, you know. <laughs> I say that ironically, it's not a big city, but, you know, based on what they were growing up, the places oh, yeah. they grew up, it was. So I always felt this, like, you know, I didn't grow up here, I didn't grow up here, but it certainly influenced my life and therefore my work as well. Right. So, yeah. So I think now that you, people knows a little bit about that you're coming from a, a feminist angle, which is, you know, and, and sewing and quilting is always sort of considered, you know, women's work, if right. you will. Right. You know, coining a phrase from, I think it was, wasn't it Carolee Schneeman who coined that phrase initially, so, women's yeah. work? And, um, and, you know, an early feminist activist, Lauren yeah. Judy Chicago and, yep. and other women. Um, so sewing and, and sort of domestic techniques are something that's always intrigued you yeah. and and therefore you this is sort of your way to as an homage and right. and exploring that you know now in a, in a different realm right the other thing that you've mentioned in uh, in our discussions and in your writing about your work is um that you are profoundly affected by sort of social cultural political yeah. things that are happening yep. and so um you know it's I think this piece is one that I think really is, is a great example that I'd like to move to. And it's, um, and it also, it is two panels constructed much like this other one, but it's not a diptych, it's intended to be one piece. Right. But um, what I love about this piece, and I think it's, it's just got so many things going on in it uh, in terms of process and, and color theory and just, you know, everything. It's just rife with uh, content. Um, but what's really nice is um, you read it as 
squares, you know, like a square part, of, and it has a, a grid feel. And then you have this wonderful element in, in each of these here, but I love the way you decided to put it together. And it doesn't look like it's just half of something. If this had been flipped around, it would have looked like, oh, just half of some other design. Right. Um, it, it's a design in and of itself, and it's full of all sorts of you know, binaries. And, and it, it looks symmetrical, but it isn't. Right. And that's what I love about your work. Just like that piece. It is not the black and white when we were looking at. It is not 100% symmetrical, right. but you immediately look at it and you see symmetry. Right. And I think that's sort of the great thing about that. You, and I'm just kind of curious, do you lay it out like a regular sort of pattern and then decide, mm, I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll do that? Or is it more organic and it just does a pattern just always seem to spontaneously emerge out of your work? It's a little bit of both. Um, it is a little bit of both. Sometimes, and I often work in a sketchbook to sketch out ideas. Um, sometimes there's a pattern in those designs, sometimes there's not. Um, but because I work with fabric, I have this large wall section um, in my studio in Ohio where it's backed with flannel, and like flannel pajamas, and the uh. cotton can be just placed on the flannel and it sticks. So it allows me to play and lay out compositions. And so once I'm happy with kind of the overall visual element, then I start constructing it. Um, and that's when some change ha changes happen. That's when, you know, obviously some, you know, I can change my mind about things. I can cut it up. Um, you know, it's not like paint where I, you can repaint over a, a place and mm -hmm. the composition if you're not happy with it, but I can certainly reuse the fabric in a different way. Um, so, you know, sometimes those, I would say, you know, visual choices um, happen during construction. This piece in particular was different. I didn't actually have it planned out this way. This was one of those sort of more, um, I thought it was going to come together different. I actually made a, uh, almost a study. There's a small piece in the show that relates to this in a way. I wondered if that was okay. Yeah, so okay. this was going to be more of a different composition. But it just, when I had it that way, just to me it was lacking something. There was, I don't know, it felt too maybe regular. And I love that idea, you know, what you've talked about, how they're like geometric, but they're not perfect. So um, the nice thing about working sort of modularly is you can, you know, play with arrangements. I mean, it's almost like this right. element of collage in my work as well, even though I'm not yeah. collaging in the traditional sense. But, you know, I can play and move things around. So that's sort of how this piece actually came to be. It was just, to me, when, it was, when they were arranged the other way and there were actually two more panels, it just, it just felt too, I think, safe, too maybe expected. Mm -hmm. And so when I divided them into two separate pieces, um, so instead of four panels, there are two. And when I laid them out this way, I felt like it was just more, um, I think, visually interesting to me maybe more active, you know, with the, originally the triangular components were in the center with this exterior, like, line work. Right. Um, but by separating them, I felt it made a stronger overall composition. Oh, I, I definitely agree. And it yeah. makes it uh, just so much more dynamic. Because yeah. um, you see these two things immediately that are similar, but then you see these two things, but yet they're, you know, because these now are like a flip, where these just almost look like you're transposing this way. Yeah. These, the purple, it, it's it's not. And then you're so you're kind of trying to figure figure out what the hell, where the how that right. begin, you know. Right. And so you know, it's it's it, that's what I like about it. And but the other thing too is just these great dichroic combinations because, you know, the the orange and purple yeah. and. And then also then you go with sort of classic complementary, the sort of the, the red and the green, right. and then you bring in this one that's got this yellow. So it's, right. like, you, it's like you have this intuitive sense of, um, because those are two different things operating in traditional painting. And so what's nice is it creates this, um, this, this vibration, this pulsing, which is, you know, what you know, a lot of the op art artists were doing, which was these, you know, very vibrational combinations that when they get together or they you see a, a third color. Right. You know, you, you don't see, uh, you know, in yours, you're, you, you don't have too much of that because you have large swaths. You right. Know, if you break it down, then you get that, that interaction, then you get the color mixing. But right. here, it's, you have this, these really strong, but everything's not, not exactly the same size and, and everything. Right. And, and so it really activates your eye. And there's a lot of power of suggestion in that. And, um, but there's also something very metaphorical going on, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Because, you know, um, as you said, you're, 
the, 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 you know, the polarities in, in politics right now, there seems to be so much of a divide socially, culturally, you know, in the country, if we talk about just in the U.S. Right. And, um, and so these sort of, in, in knowing that that's sort of when you get up in the morning, you know, and you listen to the news and you go into your studio, this is what you react to. Right. And so um, what's interesting is, and the reason why I say sort of metaphorical, is because these are, this one in particular makes me think of like a jagged edge mm -hmm. or teeth. Right. This is like, that was a jagged edge yeah. and this is like teeth, like yeah. gnawing, yeah. you know? And so what's interesting about this work is it operates to have a, um, create this power of suggestion. Because, you know, it, it, the gestalt in your mind just sees this as like, oh, these are, this is probably a part of a big square, you know? And this is a fragment of it or whatever. So, right. you know, you got it. But then you start looking at it more closely. And, and what it is is this, the, it's not wonky, but there's a wonkiness about it that, yep. that pulls you in. Right. And that's how all of your paintings are. There's a hook, yeah. you know, yeah. and you're like Katy Perry and this, you know, <laughs> one line, you can't get out of your head, you know, that's and it right. it sucks you into her songs right. every time. Right, right. And so, uh, or a riff. And so right. uh, you're quite masterful at that. But it really works well because then you see this discord, you know, because like, it, it's a square corner, you know, and I know you can do a 90 degree corner, but right. it's not quite. That's you right, know? right. And so things, you know, like this is sherbet. I mean, this is like a sherbet and this is a little bit more of a, you know, peach, but they operate sort of the same. Right. You know, and that's what I like. It's like, it's not perfect, perfect. Right. It's not matchy, matchy, nope. but you get it. Yeah. And, um, and I like this sort of discord because I, to me, in, in like the essay I wrote, I, what it seemed like to me when I look at these is it, they're, they're balanced and there's, an inter there's a harmony mm -hmm. because you know color theory mm -hmm. and, you, and I think also you just have an intuitive, an incredible intuitive sense of color, which, which you thank have you. to have yeah, thank you. when you're dealing with something that's ready made. You right. know, you, when you're scavenging and scanning and looking for things or even when you're in the studio and you're looking around going, mm, I need something, and you're like, mm, there it is, right, right, and you right. grab it, which right. I'm just assuming that's how you operate. For sure, yeah. But um, what's interesting though is, um, you know, you get it, but then what's nice is in going back then and thinking about the, the discord in social discourse or what it, political discourse, these then kind of operate that way. Right. There's a discord, you still get it, it still works, it's balanced, it's harmonic, but yet when you, upon closer inspection, you see it's not a perfect fit, it's not a perfect match, right. you know, right. and, and maybe there's a little, you know, anger or hostility here right. or something right. and maybe i'm reading too much into it but i think this is a great example yeah. um and others to a lesser extent but yet i i've always noticed in your work uh, these key elements and and i think they serve you very well because it allows you to uh, use them beyond just an aesthetic no, and I, I agree. And it, you know, speaking about the color and my choice of color, there you know there are limitations to working this way. You know, I'm. Oh yeah. This is all commercially dyed fabric. I don't mm -hmm. dye any of the fabric. It's commercially ready made. You know, so what the color is is what you get. Whereas if you are working, if someone is working with, uh, you know, any type of paint and they know how to mix color, you can make endless yes. colors. You can create, you know, very specific colors. So that's not possible with this method of working. So I've sort of just developed, I guess, a sense of, you know, what I can do with this material in the way that it already comes. Mm -hmm. And those are, you know, I'm very specific, I would say, about color choices, about placement of colors next to each other, because, you know, as we were talking, my intention is to make something visually interesting and exciting mm -hmm. and not, you know, simple and safe, I guess. Yeah, and I mean, it's just full of all sorts of just great things. And I can definitely see how it grew out of that other uh, piece. Mm -hmm. um, and as I kind of wondered if there was a kinship to mm -hmm. them. But this yellow that you, you picked up yeah. and that sort of um, limey or sagey green with it yeah. is what really uh, zings yeah. in, in, in that piece, I think. It's hard to photograph. Yes, it is. <laughs> All this stuff is. Yeah, it is. Um, but I don't do it. That's why right. I have Yao do it. Right. That's right. Because <laughs> he, he knows how to manipulate all that yeah. stuff to make yeah, it yeah. behave. 
But this other one, the reason why I wanted to kind of walk down the line, because yeah. now this is, to me, um, this piece is, to me, borders on slightly moody. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so it's, there's something about that shade of red, and I think it's because this cranberry is what does it. It neutralizes it everything. It right. pulls everything down right. because it brings in blue, I'm guessing. Right. And so um, there's just something about this, even though it has all those elements that we just talked about, yeah. you know, the jagged edges and, and all of that. But here, um, th there's a couple of really interesting things here. The neutralization of these otherwise individually very vibrant colors, but because they're so, I don't know what the color term is, I'll have to think about it, but they're all very related. In like terms analogous, of like, right? Analogous? Colors? Yeah, they're very yeah, analogous. Yeah, right. That's a good, yeah, that's the word. And so what you're using more here is you're breaking up and creating more pattern. Yeah. And there's more repetition of elements, which in many ways, because they are sort of in arrays and they're organized this way, they're not as jaw-dropping or is somehow is, is agitating to the eye, not agitating, but activating the eye right, as much right. as that one. Right. So there's something going on here, and, and it actually imparts a moodiness, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. This one just doesn't, even though red, you know, it and has red so is much so strong, <laughs> right, and so far, exactly, right. So much energy, right. but it doesn't function that way. And right. I thought that's really interesting, and I thought, wow, you know, because this has all of the hallmarks of something that should otherwise be very optical, and it's not. Right, and I think it's, you know, like these, like I feel like this red and this red, they're just so sort of muted. Yeah. Um, and I think that sort of works to bring some of that energy down. Yeah, and I think that's just sort of astounding. And there's even, the other thing I like going on here is this, um, these horizon lines. Yeah. That for some reason here, the line is more um, elemental or more, more noticeable yes. than almost than any of the other ones. I agree, yeah. And yeah. it's very interesting, and I think it's because of that uniformity and the neutralization of this general color palette that this little bit of this going, and I think that just really uh, adds a lot to it. Yeah, and I think know. even with all those strong verticals that are you know, happening in you know, terms of like the side edges, to me, it's these horizontal lines that are, are become much more powerful in the composition. And even though you may not, this may have been another one of these process things where it sort of ended up this way, but yeah. looking at it post-production, yeah. what it does is the, generally this has a diagonal right. a flow, a bias flow, right. and this actually tends, these lines tend that way, yeah, which is sort do. of it's, quirky. Yes. Yeah, no, for sure, right. And then when I first finished it, I was like, I didn't, it, it bothered me, you know, because <laughs> I wanted, I was, you know, sort of picturing more sort of actual horizontal lines, and then there was that shift, but it has certainly grown on me, and I actually think, again, it's like goes back to that idea of, you know, when is it too regular, when is it too... Uh, expected and mm -hmm. this this gradual shift unexpected you know sort of adds to the overall composition in a way that if it were more regular it would not it would yeah, be I think this is a great piece I really like it well, thank it's you. it, it thank and you. oddly to use the word subtle it, yeah. for your work right there is a subtlety about it yeah I would say especially compared to the other ones for <laughs> sure and it's because it's it's not clearly not monochrome but it's Monochrome-esque. Yeah, yeah, more that way, right. where they're all, you know, analogous colors, right. and um, and they're just permutations off of that, with the, right. with the addition of the blue in, in this one, and yeah. probably in that one. Yeah, and it's so fun, too, you know, just, this is the same color as this, but it looks different because it's paired next to two different colors. Exactly. You know? So there's that, that element of that intera color interaction. interaction. Yeah. Yes, I'm a huge fan of both Joseph and Annie Albers as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the you know color, I'm a big color. Well, I think what we're going to do is we're going to set the camera up and uh, just would like to also put a plug that if you like uh, listening to Jennifer talk about her work and, and, uh, and, uh, and hearing about you know, her background and what have you, we always do these in-depth discussions with all the artists for the, the shows and the gallery. And you can always subscribe to, uh, to these uh, videos. So um, it would be great if you subscribed and you know, there's always 
usually one or two a month being produced, and so they're always very helpful, especially for curators and critics and also for collectors sure. because it's a way to hear the artists actually talking about the work themselves. Yeah. So we'll be back in just a few minutes.